Hi, I'm Hansa Bargava, and I'm glad to be here to talk to you about getting your message heard. There's a lot of noise out there right now, and you know, many companies are on different networks, whether it's social or broadcast or um, you know, uh, on podcasts. There's you know, and it's very hard to get the attention of a consumer. So it's worth thinking about your strategy and getting your message heard, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's move on to the next slide. So there's a lot of platforms that exist right now, and you know, the traditional platforms that have been out there, such as broadcast or radio, are still out there, but the viewership has typically declined in those. So although they're good areas to market yourself and your company, uh, there's other platforms that are really important to bring into your marketing strategy. And that includes social, with 2.3 billion users, uh, and that expected to grow. It's really important to have a voice on social. Now, social platforms vary. So you've got Twitter and Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and really it depends on the audience that you're going after in terms of social. So some social platforms will have an older audience, uh, some social platforms will have a younger audience, and then there's gender disparities as well. So you do want to find out where your audience lives. There's blogs. That's a great way to actually just have some writing pieces out there, some very short three-paragraph pieces to eight-paragraph pieces. If people do read them, and it's a good way to get your name out there as well as you know your company's name out there as well. Op-eds can also help, uh, especially if it's a timely topic. Uh, our company uses newsletters a lot, and that's essentially emailing uh, frequently to your user base in subjects that they might be interested in. We also have started using push notifications as well. Again, you know, using apps to get your message across. And then podcasts have been on the rise as well. And in fact, the viewership for podcasts is about 68 million users, so it is definitely an um, interesting group of people who are um, wanting to listen, and those, those that type of content is a little bit different in that you know a lot of these other types of content are short attention spans. Podcast listeners who listen to podcasts actually listen for a long time, so it can be a 15 minute podcast, or even a 30 minute or 45 minute podcast. So again, that audience is different, and knowing whether that audience is your audience really makes a difference. And then of course you've got your typical broadcast. Stations, you know, if you have a product that's released, your PR release, you have the opportunity to get on broadcast and talk about it, that can help as well. So let's go to the next slide. So, you know, at WebMD, where I'm a senior medical director in Medscape, they have really um, used their content well to gain their audience. And, you know, we do have 76 million uh, monthly unique users, and, uh, you know, we do that has grown year over year, and we've been uh, both you know, on the laptop or on the desktop as well as mobile, and mobile has grown a lot. So if you are uh, doing content online, it's really important to be in the mobile space as well, whether it's just you know mobile interface or whether it's an app uh, that helps the user access your content, it's really important to have a mobile aspect to your content. So let's move on. So there's four basic ingredients to kind of get yourself out there. Uh, you definitely want to have good content, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. You want to know your audience. So, you know, again, we talked, alluded to this before, uh, you know, who, who is your audience? Who's your target audience? You know, is it 20 to 30 year olds? Is it millennials? Is it you know, is it pharmaceutical companies? Is it business people? You just want to know your audience, and that way you can actually tweak your content and also your strategy according to that. Uh, the strategy is really important in that, you know, what platform are you going to use? How often are you going to use it? Is it frequent? How are you going to get those email addresses if you want to push out content? And then most importantly, and I do think this is part of the secret sauce of WebMD, is brand integrity. So, you know, whatever, especially with the millennials at this point, uh, they really do pay attention to integrity. They want to make sure the company that they're with are, um, are loyal to have integrity and that they're, even, for millennials specifically, there's even a goodwill component. And you'll see this, you know, when you see the coffee out there or the products out there where it says, you know, fair traded, and there's, there's a growing audience 
for that kind of brand integrity too. But uh, just going back to online and corporate integrity, I think it's really important to kind of know who you are and kind of stick to who you are and, you know, and have at least perceived integrity around that. So let's talk a little bit more about content. Content is really important no matter what company you are. At WebMD, we really think carefully about our content. And the content, there's two areas we think about. One is what's really important for our audience to know, but also what is important that our audience will engage in. And in order to identify that, we really know our audience. We choose topics that have been elevated by research studies or by you know, other entities, depending on what, how the audience will engage with them. So for example, one topic area that our audience engages in a lot is toxins that are out there in the environment, in food, in plastic, and we know that, and we also know that there's a lot of research coming out on that, so that's, that's, um, that's content that we've done special reports on, as well as, you know, just, um, made a lot of articles on as well. So important topics really matter, and that really is relevant to your audience and who you are. Newsjacking. That's another way to elevate content. So what's in the news right now? You know, what actually can we be related to that's in the news right now? Is it hospital infections and we make something that helps reduce infections? Or is it, you know, that a lot more people have vitamin D deficiency, which will lead to fractures, which, you know, could mean more hip replacements or knee replacements. You know, there's a lot of examples. So is there a way that you can tag yourself to what's happening in the news and what's hot in the news? And part of that is also not just looking at the news, but also looking at trends. So Google Trends is a way that you can actually find out what's hot and what's now. Uh, a lot of social outlets like Twitter and other social outlets can also tell you what's hot and what's now and if there's a way to thread yourself into that right then that always helps elevate your company or yourself you know in the spotlight because it's really hard to cut through the noise so take those opportunities um, there's also content strategy so SEO so basically what words will help uh, a user find my content you know what words are people gravitating towards and a, a great example for us was you know we wanted to, you know, fatigue, we noticed that fatigue was something that our user was searching for, but interestingly, our SEO expert found out that it wasn't just a title of an article called fatigue. In fact, you had to frame it correctly. So instead of saying fatigue, uh, we found out that what helped people come to our article was really, why am I feeling tired? Or why am I feeling so tired all the time? So tweaking those titles, tweaking the words in your content can actually help users find your content. And that is about for everyone, for every company to get their content found on the internet because there's just so much noise. Once you know your user and your audience, it's nice to kind of have profiles on them, uh, some data on that, just to know what they like, and then you can actually offer them like content. And you've seen this in other websites as well, where there's content that you've searched for on their website before, and you seem to get that elevated to you whenever you go, go there. Or, you know, I'm looking, up, looking for content about knee pain, and now I'm getting some content about acupuncture or, um, you know, or physical therapy because I looked for knee pain. So having that algorithm where you are getting content that's offered, um, depending on what you're, you know, what the user wants and has experienced previously. Let's go to the next slide. Content is really important to also frame it in the way that your user or your audience understands. So whether it's online, whether it's a presentation that you're doing, you know, make sure that you're using words that engage the audience and, you know, they can actually understand it. So, for example, I'm a physician, and the way that I talk to a physician about a certain article or research study is going to be very different than in how I talk to a patient or a person who's not in the medical field. It doesn't make sense for me to use words that they don't understand. I really need, and I'm just talking about my patient interactions, I need to find words that they will understand, otherwise the message is lost. So you want to keep it simple. Simplicity is wonderful. Most people operate, and most uh, print, as well as online content sites will tell you that most people operate at the fourth or fifth grade language level. So, you know, what a fourth and fifth grade would read 
in the language they read it is really how you want to present your information, unless it's a professional audience. Um, you want to know that you know what kind of words to use and what's you know what makes most sense. You want it to be engaging. I mean, you don't want to just get up. You know, all of us have attended talks where people get out there and they talk about something, and you know, after about five minutes, you've just disengaged because they're saying either the same thing or they're you know using using information that you're not really interested in. So again, knowing what will actually engage the audience and will be worthy of their time because time's a premium for everyone. Uh, small digestible sound bites really are helpful, and this is more for videos or interviews. Uh, you release a product, you've been asked by uh, some trade company or a trade reporter to talk about it. You definitely want to make it small. You want to stop, let them actually ask questions rather than um, going on about something. I, I do remember uh, as part of my position here, I often interview experts, and I still remember this one expert I interviewed and I asked him a question. He literally went on for five or six minutes with the answer. And the producer at the back was waving her hand saying, please stop. <laughs> you know, that's too long. And, you know, it is too long. It is too long because people really don't have that attention span. They really, you kind of want to go back and forth in an interview, interview station, situation where people are both talking or, you know, in a presentation or talking out loud. You just want small sound bites and takeaways that, you know, that are really, that, that, that people can engage in. And this is also really true of videos. Generally speaking, if people are viewing videos, whether it's on YouTube or some social network, most people will lose attention within a minute. So do not have videos that are more than a minute in general. Uh, the only exception to that rule is really the podcast audience. They seem to be able to pay attention for long periods of time, and that may just be because they're listening in the car or they're listening while they're running, so they have more time. But you know, if, if, they, if people are at work or people just want to view a short video, generally speaking, keep it under a minute. And the other thing that um, research has found is that it's really helpful to have subscripts under videos. So if you have some content video that you're putting out, uh, it's really important to have a subscript un under it because 80% of people don't really want to listen to it, they just want to read it. Um, or they might not activate the sound because they're in a public place and, and they just, you know, they will not listen. They'll just read what's under it. So have, have those words. So again, the small digestible bites are really interesting. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, did a um, little video for vaccinations, uh, which is my space. <laughs> and, um, you know, she said, go get your flu shot. And she came up with this little thing on her video, which was less than a minute. And underneath there was such a flu before boot. Well, it was because she was doing the video around Halloween. And that was really great. Three words, flu before boot. So get your flu shot before Halloween. And so things like that really resonate. They stick with people. Another one that I will offer up is a leadership seminar I attended. And you know, she's talking about leadership and she's talking about how it's important to kind of uh, elevate your, yourself in certain situations. But uh, she said, you know, it's better to actually show them your work rather than telling them your work. And so she put out three words, show, don't tell. And again, that was a takeaway because it's three words. It's easy for me to remember and, you know, apply that. So it's really important to have short uh, little sound bites that people can remember. Stories. Stories have a lot of power. We tell a lot of stories at WebMD, and the stories really resonate with the audience. Uh, you know, uh, we've done stories on maternal mortality after delivery, and we took patients and patients who wanted to tell their stories, uh, told stories about what happened after that. Um, you know, we've had a recent release uh, on hospital uh, emergency rooms, and again, all of it started with story. You know, stories have been legendary, have, have had the legendary power since the beginning of time. You've got stories in the Bible, you've got it's those fables, we tell stories for our children, and they really are really great avenues to get a message across. So if you, for example, are a medical device company or a pharma company, great to have a story about how that changed the person's life, you know, how they felt, how they were having difficulty before they got the device, and then after the device, what happened. So those kind of stories are really important. It doesn't have to be always about your product. 
Um, yeah, sometimes there's stories that are indirectly related that could be important. So, you know, maybe it's the story of somebody getting a knee replacement, but it's you know, how that impacted his wife or his child or, you know, people around him. So it's not about him or the knee replacement, but, you know, how these chronic illnesses can actually impact uh, other people and how, you know, how, how that affects everyone in your sphere. So, uh, you know, those, those stories are important too. And then you want to have benevolent content. I think it's important to have, to be around uh, the do good part. And, you know, personally, I believe that passionately. I believe that, you know, every, you know, everyone has that responsibility of doing some good for the world as well. But even if you're not a believer of that, it, it will really come up in spades to actually show that you're doing things around your topic that can actually have impact on society. So I think it's good for people, but it's also good for the company and for you. So we talked about this a little bit before, the audience, you wanna know who you're speaking to and you're gonna tweak your messages according to who you're speaking to. Very different message to millennials versus seniors, women versus men, parents versus non-parents. Uh, you wanna tailor that message and simplify it, we talked about that. And you wanna give them an experience, you know, you, you want to make them feel like you know their story. So if it's you know, content, uh, tell them about what they're looking for, but also tell them about other things that might be pertinent to them uh, in their life. So whether it's, you know, I have the flu, and you know, here's my product, which is a flu shot, let me tell you about the flu shot. It's also about, you know, how that flu impacted that person's life. You know, they were out for 10 days, uh, you know, their kids had difficulty going to school. Here's another story that's really interesting that again, it's not exactly about what happened, but everything else that happened about them and, and the experience basically. And that's basically, you know, a person um, is diagnosed with a chronic disease, then within a few months, his wife is diagnosed with, you know, or, or falls and breaks her wrist, and now they're both out of work, and how that impacts their lifestyle. Now they, you know, they don't, they can't get their groceries. So, you know, that, that kind of story and that experience with not just the issue, which is potentially diabetes, because that's what you're about, um, that experience actually helps elevate your message in an indirect fashion um, in helping in helping kind of get that message across. And remember, it's, you know, the best way to get your information out there is to know that ultimately for people to process that message and to internalize that message, it needs to be about them. It's not about you, it's not about your company, uh, you know, it's not about your product, it's really about them and how they can, it matters to them. And that's, that's a really hard thing to remember, but it's really important, whether it's presentation, whether it's social media, whether it's online presence, you know, whether, whether you're talking to a person. I often, when I speak to reporters, I try to get to know them a little bit to understand where they're coming from. So, you know, if somebody, if a reporter has, has kids, then, you know, that kind of gives me a common ground to talk to them about, you know, something outside the interview process, gives that relationship a little bit of importance if it, you know if it's if it's a person who plays sports or drives a Honda you know that's nice to know about them beforehand so that you can actually you know get some common ground so you know you know if it's a person that you're interviewing you're talking to it's nice to know a little bit about them but if it's the audience also you want to know what kind of motivates them and what's important to them so that you frame your speaking or your content or your stories or you know whatever you're doing around them So this is more about if you are in an interview situation or you're talking to a reporter or, you know, um, you're in a panel discussion talking about your company, uh, you know, the way that you talk and the way that your facial expressions are, the way that your body posture is, is really important. So the 58387 rule, uh, and Professor Mirabian actually came up with this, basically said that only 7% of what you say actually matters in the communication. The other is basically nonverbal communication. Your body language and your facial expressions and how you say the words. So, and actors know this really, really well. So, they are taught to lift the words off their page. So, the way you say one a sentence actually matters. Uh, so, uh, and you know, the tone of your voice and the pronunciation of the words actually matters. So, 
38% is actually your voice and how you say something, what expression you bring to it. Is it sadness? Is it happiness? You know, um, I could say that let's just take the election, you know, you, that just happened in the state of Georgia. So the gut, you could say that, you could say, well, um, um, the, new, the new Secretary of State is a Democrat. So I said that. And, or I could say, the new Secretary of State is a Democrat. That, that, that tone difference can tell you how I'm feeling. Or the new St Secretary of State is a Democrat. Again, that's a positive tone. So the way you say that same sentence actually really matters, and also your expression matters, and you know, how, how your body language is. In, in an interview specifically, you know, if you're crossing your arms and talking to a person, you're, you know, you're not opening your mouth a lot, it's, your jaw is clenched, that gives you a very different feeling than, you know, smiling and having an open, open arms, not crossing your legs in a seat and, um, and, you know, uh, not, not having your mouth closed all the time. So it really elevates your trust and engagement if you, if you pay attention to how you're talking and how you use your body language. A few other pointers, you don't want to say ums a lot if you're presenting, it's distracting. Uh, you know, using your body language is great, but if you use your hands a lot, or you know, you lift your eyes, eyebrows a lot, you don't have a straight face, that can actually work against you. Uh, you know, it's, and again, it's really important to have a slight smile on your face unless you're talking about something that's not smile worthy or sad. And don't speak quietly, you know, have your voice. Often what we do is we start finishing the sentence and at the end of the sentence, the voice actually wanes. You definitely want to keep an even keel to what you're talking about at all times. So let's summarize uh, what we talked about. So uh, it is, I think, messaging and marketing is really important for any company. There's plenty of platforms that exist but it's really important to have a strategy around it, and there are definitely rules around it. So whether it's you know an interview or talking out loud, or whether it's social content that you're posting, whether it's video content that you're posting, it's important to know what actually works and also to know your audience. For WebMD and Medscape, uh, who I work for, and for all the work that I've done, I realized that there's not really a secret sauce, but what's really, really important is integrity to establish trust with your audience, with your user base, with your clients, with your, with your patients. And you know, that can go a long way. And for, for WebMD, uh, they would say that that's probably their secret sauce, brand integrity. And so don't always be true to your mission, always be true to your vision. Uh, and also always you know, come out with integrity. Do not, do not sell your soul uh, because it will at some point come back and bite you or your company. Um, and always remember, it's, it's about them. So if you can figure out what's in their head and what actually activates them, that will help you go a long way. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bargava. That was a great talk. I just have a question about something I've been thinking about. I get information uh, via reading my social network's tweets and their Facebook posts and Instagram videos, things like that. And I just wondered if you had seen any trends about the way the things that trend in that kind of a platform. Yes, I think that's a great question, Allison. Um, and I have seen some trends depending on the social media interface that you're using. So I would say that, first of all, the audience is different for Twitter and versus uh, Facebook, which tends to be more women. Uh, and older, Twitter tends to be more 25 to 40 year olds. Also, there's a lot of doctors on Twitter, weirdly and strangely, but there are. Um, Instagram is, you know, is another audience group. So it depends on the audience in terms of what topic might resonate. So um, what I do is personally is if I think a topic will resonate, I will always, if it's an article that I'm really interested in, I'll always add a comment. That actually helps the shares because if you just share an article, um, you know, people might read it and say, oh, whatever. But if you have a comment and personalizes it and you know, something is something you care about, uh, you know, lately I've been tweeting out a lot about women leadership. Women in leadership, and you know, we just had a huge discussion that really got a lot of shares and it was about imposter syndrome. 
And you know, so with Fox, so I, I tweeted out that you know, is this you know, Michelle Obama has spoken recently when he was in the film, and so that was tweeted out to me. Uh, but she didn't put a comment on it, and so I took that tweet and I put a comment on it saying, you know, imposter syndrome can be experienced by everyone, and you know, the, the question is how do you get over it? And what I say is to myself, I let the voice that says I can do it speak louder than the one that says I can't do it. Um, and then I tagged a few people, and gosh, that really kind of took off because it was something that everyone was kind of engaging. You know, who did it take off with? It took off with women. Right, like not a lot of men. Although there were some men who actually engaged in it as well. So again, it's it's the audience. Like who you know, who do I want to pull into this conversation? Now I'm going to compare that to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is another uh, social media enterprise that's being used more and more frequently. And so for that enterprise, what I'll do is I, I usually stay away from personal topics there, but more about business topics. So for example, if there's an innovation that I'm really interested in. You know, I will tweet that out, but I, not tweet that, sorry, not share that. Um, but I will obviously go ahead and put my commentary on it as well. Um, and, you know, that helps people kind of engage in it. Plus, my name kind of comes up. And then I'll also tag other people like Allison, uh, you know, uh, so, that I, so that person, when they get tagged, that helps a lot as well because they'll kind of share it and they'll interact with it as well. So calling out people, knowing the audience and the topic that you share are really important. That's great. Thanks very much. Hansa, earlier in the uh, presentation, you talked about uh, that there are different uh, uh, platforms, uh, social media platforms for different target markets. How do you go about learning? I mean, we all know Facebook, but the younger kids aren't using Facebook as much anymore. How do you go finding where your target market is once you've identified your target and segmented them and, and got your positioning done? So I think that's a great question. So yeah, finding what your market is and who your audience is and aligning that with the platform you're using is really important. So there's a few ways to find out. So if it's a social platform that you're talking about or, you know, a media station, you can actually just research it. Uh, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, all of those uh, very long standing social platforms. Uh, the research is actually out there in terms of audiences. You'd be surprised at how many trade journals actually have that information. Uh, for medical professionals, I often will turn to Becker's Hospital Review uh, to find out more about the hospital situation. Um, for consumer audience, I'll often turn to uh, the Pew organization that does incredible research and surveys, um, you know, for, for a wide variety of topics, and you can actually see those topics on the right rail. And then, lastly, Google searches can actually help you as well. You just need to be really specific in what you're asking uh, in the Google searches. In terms of analytics, you can actually use Google Analytics as well, but that's more for trends. Um, the other thing I would do is what I found through my own mistakes is, you know, if a reporter wants me to talk about a PR release or whatever information or topic that's trendy, I'll actually ask them what their audience is beforehand. Like, who's your audience? You know, who is your typical audience? For example, Vice interviewed me. Their, their, their audience is very different than Reuters. You know, and so you should, like, depending on who their organization is, their audience is very different. And so you can shape the message accordingly. The New York Post has interviewed me. The New York Post's audience is quite different than, uh, say, the Atlantic or the New York Times. And so, you know, you can frame your messages depending on, you know, who, who you're talking to. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, uh, Jason, I have one more question, if okay. that's okay. Yep. Um, so I was going to ask you, a lot of the device companies and biologics companies that, that are member organizations of SEMDA, um, when we deliver information, sometimes it's a little dry, right? It's not, maybe it's, maybe it's really compelling to us because we're passionate about it, but maybe it's dry to some of the people who we might be targeting. And so I wondered if you had any tips or suggestions about how to communicate that kind of information maybe on a screen in a way that is compelling. I'm sure at WebMD you guys do a lot of um, looking at how to present that kind of information because it's, it's not necessarily all wildly interesting, but you want to make it as compelling as possible to pull the readers in. Sure. And so I'm going to ask you, are you, it depends on the information, like is it a new product that you want to talk about? 
um, or is it you know something else? So if it's a new product, for example, I think um, for example, I'll talk about a product that we actually put out there uh, a couple years back, and so it was actually a pregnancy app. And so we had developed a pregnancy app, and, and, and so what we did was we looked at the pregnancy app and we said, well, how is this going to help our user? You know, why is there a need for another app that, you know, with the thousands of apps out there, and how do we differentiate ourselves? So we figured out what differentiated our, our product, and then what we did was we actually built stories around it. So, for example, one thing that differentiated our product was basically that, you know, we were vet, it was vetted by physicians and that there was actually a timeline where we could offer up information about what was happening when you didn't know that you needed it. So we talked about, you know, having a doctor in your pocket. So that, you know, whenever you don't even know that your baby is doing X, Y, and Z at three months, into your pregnancy, but we're going to push notification to you and tell you about it. So, again, making it relevant to their lives because you know if our audience is pregnant women and they want to know what's going on today in my tummy and what is happening, why is the baby kicking? Then we know when you started your pregnancy. You know when you eliminated, and we can tell you that as soon as you open it up that this is what's happening to you right now. So, so basically, again, going back to the relevance, and then of course story. Really stories of how a person could use this product and it could actually make a difference in their life. So, you know, biologics make a huge difference. It's a huge difference. So, patient cases and stories, um, they don't have to be real patient cases. You obviously want to honor the fact. But, you know, uh, leaving that story around the device uh, is really important. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you, Hansa. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. I have so we have Hansa on, and so I am going to promote her and Allison. Hello, Hansa. We see you now. Allison, uh, I don't. I don't know if you could hear us. Um, hey, Jason. Yes. I can hear you, but I won't be able to do video. Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> Jason, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Hansa. Great. So we did have um, one question. I don't know if Allison, if if you have others. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, f feel free to type it into the chat um, over at the bottom. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I see one, and I did get one, Hansa. What's the best way to keep newsletters interesting and engaging? You know, a lot of times, at least for us anyway, we talk about a lot of dates and conferences and things. So just any advice on that? Yeah, I think newsletters are a great way to reach your audience. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a few ways that you can keep them engaging and, and interesting. If If you have a way to actually see your open rate and um, which of your audience actually open what types of letters you can kind you can tweak your newsletters to that audience in that you give them what they're interested in so whether that is about a certain product or if there's stories that they're interested in or there's uh, news reports that they're interested in you can actually customize the newsletters to the audience also, I will go back to what I said before, you know, if you, you know, if there's anything that's newsworthy that you can actually attach your product to or your, uh, your preference to or your information to, to make it relevant to whatever is trending, that can help as well. And it almost, you almost have to be nimble in terms of knowing what the trends are and seeing if that's actually relevant to you. And, and sending a newsletter uh, according to that topic as well. So I would, I would go back to know your user and see if there's any trends that you can identify for that specific user in terms of what the open rate is and also um, keep your ear out uh, to see what's trending out there and if there's any news items that are, that are worth attaching your information to. Thank you. Um, and Colette, if you want to ask a follow up to that, you can text me. <laughs> um, one more in the from the um, in the chats. What would you say about titles of articles? Uh, any suggestions on making them captivating? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, titles definitely have a lot of weight 
most people will scan a title and click on that depending on whether it's interesting to them or not. I think the titles can be, you can be creative with your titles as long as you stick to the truth and you know, you don't, you don't uh, make the title misleading. So, you know, something that we found really effective is titles that basically give you solutions. So five ways to control your diabetes or even better, five ways that you didn't know that could affect your sugar levels. Uh, you know, that article actually did really well for us. So I think, I think that the two areas that are really important are making it, making it really simple. So whoever walks in feels like, oh, this is gonna be simple and easy read, and then offering them in the title something that they may not know, uh, which makes them captivated by the title. Great. That's a, that's a great answer. I think, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a tough one. And I like the, you know, the five things to help your diabetes. Um, how, what about the timing and about how long a topic stays hot? Like, how, so how long does you keep it up? How long do you need to refresh it? Um, and then how long do we have to respond to a hot topic? So once it's hit, you know, if we're, if it's two days, that seems too late <laughs> now. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question, Jason. Uh, or, you know, and, and, and I think that it is really important to know that in this era, uh, news cycles are really short and very, you know, people have very short attention spans to actually listen. So that's why I think it's really important to allot some resources in terms of looking at what's in the news, what's coming up in the research. If you're a news organization, you have the advantage of getting some research and studies under embargo, but if you're not, you can still keep your ear to the ground and act upon it immediately. So even getting, say, an Apple news feed or WebMD has a news, uh, you know, uh, newsletters that kind of send you things about what's in the news uh, lately, or even uh, sites like Doximity and, and Medscape. Medscape, I know we, you know we are part of Medscape, that they have some great, um, great types of keeping you up to date. If you see that there's a lot of, and then once you see that there's that topic has a lot of chatter, it's really great if you can actually turn things around that day or within at least within a couple of days, depending on the topic. Most news around health probably uh, goes downwards within two to three days. Uh, and then also remembering the platforms to get it out. So is it your website that you just want to kind of get a relevant article that's uh, around that trendy topic out, or is it also social media feeds or LinkedIn? So using all your platforms that you have access to, to kind of get into the conversation, it's really important to be in the conversation what's happening for, because you basically use that wave and you amplify yourself through that wave that's already happening as opposed to creating that wave. Great. That's a great answer. Thanks. Uh, how about, uh, how about images? Uh, when you choose images in, uh, you know, in your articles, how do you how do you choose those? I know, you know, it's interesting. I've, um, you know, seen talks on how to use humor images, uh, both in presenting, but then also in articles. So how do you, how do you decide that? Well, I think we try to stay with the content of the article as much as possible. We try, we, we don't want to veer off the topic because the image can look unusual. Also, we try to, you know, we do try to stay with positive images if we're trying to advise patients or people on how to get better or avoid disease. Food tends to do really well um, <laughs> on the recipes. I don't think that's something that's probably intuitive, but, uh, you know, people like to look at recipes, even though we all don't like to cook or don't have time to cook. <laughs> so I think food does really, really well. And then additionally, just since you brought it up, I think uh, that's a really good point because in uh, when you post on social accounts, definitely if you have an image, it will go much further. People will not really be interested in, you know, a tweet or a share that doesn't have an image. You, might, you really have to attach an image to get engagement. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, when we do social, um, I use a lot of our logos and different things, but so I, it's a good idea to maybe experiment with that and see if I start, you know, get more hits. 
Um, you know, one thing that you, uh, you brought up earlier, early on is SEO. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's fairly intimidating for people who aren't really web developers or, you know, really into the, um, into that sort of thing. So what's your 30,000 foot, what SEO is and, you know, how to figure it out on a zero budget? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. So, you know, SEO is basically search engine optimization and essentially certain words uh, in your content actually trigger where it will live when you do a Google search on it. Most people actually search Nowadays, don't go to websites. They'll use use a search engine, most often Google, uh, to do you know phrase search or word search when they're looking for for information. And so, what SEO does is it helps you find the words that are actually being used most or phrases that are being used most. And I agree that it can be costly. But there are ways around that as well. You can look at Google Analytics. And the other thing to note is that uh, the algorithms change quite frequently. So, you know, at some point something might be working for you, but it's worth checking in to see where the search engine is elevating you to on a regular basis. So Google does go in and change its algorithms quite a bit. And so Part of the job, part of kind of monitoring that is also tracking to make sure the algorithm's still the same. And now you're, you're coming up as number one or two on the first page. And then now all of a sudden you're buried on the third page of the search because they've changed the algorithm. So uh, I think that's, that's really important too. Yeah, you know, and that's the, I think that's one of the hardest things uh, is keeping up because I know it does change, does change a lot. And, or, you know, one of the things you said, um, uh, I can't remember what your what your phrase was early or, or when someone is searching on tired, you know, if you put just put in tired, it um, doesn't always get them. They'll they'll type why am I always tired and and that is SEO right. Yes. You're you're working on what are they actually ask, asking and so, you know, that's a, a good way I think about it as, as well because I it, I've learned to to in 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 a Google search ask the question, just type it out how I'd ask a person. Uh, and so for those on, you know, that's one way that um, you can get it in there. I completely agree, Jason. I think phrases and the way people talk is much more likely to pull up the information um, that people want. So I think that's, it's really important to pay attention to that. Okay. Um, I have, I, I'm a big branding guy. I, I like branding. I like marketing. Uh, I think it's a really important to think about, you know, early in the presentation, you talked about know who you are. Do you have any comments to entrepreneurs or folks starting a company about that, about how to figure out who you are? What's your, uh, one way described to me recently that I really like, what's your mythology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's really important to stay in one lane, to stay on that lane and to focus. And a lot of us tend to divert from that. So I think if you're a young company or you're starting up, it's probably important to have a vision, uh, you know, that, that kind of guides you and is your North Star. So what is that vision? Is it like impact on health? Is it to be the best hip replacement company ever? Um, is it that you care about a patient and you care about the post-operative follow-up uh, of a patient, and that's where it's guiding you. So if you have that vision and then hopefully a mission underneath it, that can actually help you decide where you're going. Um, I remember hearing Apple speak, and you know they have they do have a guiding light actually, and, and at least you know when I heard them speak, it was to be unique and to be different. And that's interesting to me because you look at the history of the company and, you know, you know, when they pivoted to the iPhone, they were definitely unique and they were definitely different. And now recently they came out with the Apple Watch EKG. And, yeah, you could argue that there's other devices out there that measure EKGs, but, you know, they're unique and different in that they were, you know, they're one of the first devices that are integrated into the watch that actually can spot an arrhythmia. Um, you know, in a very user friendly fashion. And so, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's something that kind of crosses a threshold of uh, medical devices, but also wearables. 
And so I think going back to your question is basically, you know, know, know thyself, you know, know who you are and stay with that vision and always go back to it when you are, you know, going through the year priorities or strategizing about where you're going from here, go back to that and, and, you know, make sure everything kind of is tethered to that. Great. Thank you. We're getting, we're getting close. So any, any final thoughts, uh, things that you wish you had said? <laughs> you know, I think, I think the biggest thing is really, um, it is not easy to break through the noise. I think, you know, getting out there and messaging uh, is, is not easy, but it is, it's possible as long as, you know, you know your audience well and you know yourself well to be really simple with your language, to, use small words and realize that people have very little time. So the simpler and the more impactful your message is, uh, I think the better it is. And then also just be, have your ear to the ground and listen to what's going on out there because that can actually really help you in terms of timing as well. So the right timing, the right message, the right words, and just making it really short and simple. Great. Thank you. I, um, for those that were on earlier, I had forgotten to, turn my microphone on. So uh, I just wanted to follow up with that. We will get this on to our YouTube channel pretty quickly um, today, tomorrow, uh, for sure. Uh, and also wanted to announce if uh, you weren't able to make the, the holiday social last night with George Bio and Raps and Women, uh, Women in Bio, we did announce our uh, 2018 Medtech Woman of the Year, uh, which is who is Lori Chamura from Dune Medical Devices. Uh, so, want to congratulate her, and also uh, to let everyone know the the Semda conference is going to be April 8th through the 10th uh, at the Hotel Avalon in um, Alpharetta. So, hopefully, we'll see everybody there. Thank you, Hansa, very much for thank for you, your time. and thank you, you, Allison, for for helping with this. And I hope everyone has a great day and a great weekend. And happy holidays, since we won't see each other until then. All right. Bye-bye.